And a uh, very warm welcome also to all of you at HDB Onso Square. Fantastic to have you with us today. A few months ago, I was at a lunch and I found myself seated next to the Israeli ambassador, Daniel Taub. And we had a, an amazing lunch and conversation and we struck up a friendship. Uh, he very kindly offered to help me. I was doing some, trying to trace some of the things that had happened in my family, some of my family members who had died in the Holocaust, and he very kindly offered to help me with that. And we started a correspondence, and I went to see him uh, at the embassy. Uh, we, we got chatting about various things. And then I discovered this uh, about him, was that, that he has a love for the Bible. And in fact, he's written a book about the Bible. It's kind of like... I do, Pippa and I, some of you know, do this little commentary on the Bible in one year, and we send out our thoughts. And he's written a book, which is like the equivalent. It's the, it's the Bible in one year. It's like the, the, daily, the weekly readings in the Torah. And he started to talk about some of the Hebrew words and what they meant. And I thought, wow, this is absolutely fascinating. Because, of course, Jesus was a first century Jew, and the only Bible he had was the Hebrew Scriptures. And therefore, the more that we can understand the Hebrew Scriptures, the deeper and richer our insight into Jesus. And so then I discovered that he uh, went around and spoke in synagogues and even in churches. So I was delighted to hear this, and he kindly offered to come and speak here. So we're absolutely thrilled that he's here this morning, and I uh, really give him a very warm welcome as he comes up. Daniel, thank you so much for coming. We are absolutely thrilled to have you here. And I'm thrilled to be here. You know, I grew up on synagogue music, but you guys have some absolutely brilliant songs, so it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> yeah, you say a bit about this, the, this love for the Bible that you have. Uh, the Bible, really, it's the, the center of our lives. As you said, I, you know, in Jewish life, every week we reread a portion of the Hebrew Bible. We go around the whole thing in a year. And, um, and I think those of you who have done something that will have just seen something strange which is that when you read a, a particular section of the Bible each week, in an uncanny way, it seems to have a relevance for what is going on in your life. It sometimes seems quite remarkable. And, and obviously, living in Israel, there's an extra dimension to that because you look up from the Bible and the land is all around you. I live just minutes away from the Temple Mount, from the Mount of Olives. I take my children to play where David fought Goliath, and it's extraordinary. I think, unfortunately, they've picked up too much from there, from the way they play with each other. <laughs> and the other thing, of course, you know, is, is the way that the Bible becomes a meeting place for people of different faiths. You know, we bring different things to it, but Jews, Christians, Muslims can meet in the text. You know where I live in Jerusalem? You know, I'm woken up early in the morning, first of all, because I hear the Muezzin, the Islamic leaders calling out from their, from their towers. And then just across from where we live, there's a convent, so I hear the bells of the convent. And then about a, an hour or so later, I see the first Jewish people walking to synagogue. And I always say a little quiet prayer of thanks to God for putting me in the religion that wakes up the latest. <laughs> <laughs> And you talked about your children there. Obviously, a big thing in, in the Hebrew Scriptures is the family. And you, you've got a big family. Yeah, we have, thank God, thank God we have six children. Um, uh, four of them have already left school, so uh, they're still in Israel at the moment. We have two with us at the moment. Family is extraordinarily important. You know, in, in Jewish life, the most holy moments, funnily enough, aren't in the synagogue, but they're actually in the home with the family around the table. So when we have the Passover Seder or we have Friday night dinner, it's extraordinarily special. Um, and I think, you know, God tells us in the Bible that you are my children. And I think that's one of the ways that we can come close to him, that we can model that relationship of that family in the way that we create those relationships for us. Although it's not easy, I have to say, in Israel, we raise extraordinarily independent children. Um, there's something that's called the Bamba effect. The Bamba effect, the, every child in Israel grows up 
eating a childhood snack. It looks like crisp, but it's peanut flavored. Um, and, it, you know, the, the, that's what kids grow up eating. And um, there was some scientific research done. And it turns out incredibly that it, kids in Israel are 10 times less likely to have peanut allergies than any other country because they are exposed to peanuts at a very early age. And I think in a way it's a sort of metaphor for the way that you expose your kids. So our kids are very involved in sort of leadership. We allowed them to do things that maybe are a little bit risky, but the hope is they're gonna come out that little bit stronger, but it means that being a parent is a bit more challenging. <laughs> well, I, 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 I read in your book that, that you, you learned many of your diplomatic and negotiating skills from your children. From I don't know <laughs> if I've learned them. My toughest <laughs> negotiations are with my children. Uh, <laughs> you know, and you never know if you're doing it right. Uh, I, um, one day one of my children came home from school and he said to me, you know how Moses wanted to go into the Holy Land? And I said, yes. He said, he really, really wanted to go into the Holy Land. And I said, yes, and I'm feeling quite proud of him. And then he says, that's how much I want a PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know if you're doing it right or not. <laughs> the, the, uh, the readings that you, 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 you do in this, in this book, it, take, us, take us through, because they're, they're all from the Torah. They're all, uh, uh, and, of course, that starts with creation. This is a, a doctrine, of course, we share. Say, say why this doctrine of creation is so important. Um, well, creation, of course, is the, is the start of everything. And I think ultimately there's only one creator. The creator is, the creator is God. And in a sense, we try and, we try and imitate, him, imitate him through our acts of creation. The, the, the person who Moses asked to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, the most creative character in the, in, in the Hebrew Bible, is called in Hebrew Bezalel, and you're going to help me here. Bezalel. Bezalel. <laughs> And his name in Hebrew means in the shadow of God, because everything we're doing is, in a sense, an imitation of God's act of creation. And it's interesting, for the, for the years that the Jews were, were in exile, they were very, very cautious about creation. The fact is, um, we would write music and so on, but by and large, we didn't want to be drawn into too much, you know, almost idolatrous creative activity. And it was only when the Jews came back to Israel that they felt that they could spread their wings. You know, it's interesting, the French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, writing 200 years ago, he said something remarkable. He said, we will never know what the Jews have to say until they have a country of their own. And I feel that the Jews coming back to their land after 2,000 years gives us a canvas where we can explore what does it mean to have Jewish film, what does it mean to have, you know, a much broader range of expression. So it's a very exciting time. The, um, the Bible that we read, the Old Testament, of course, is written in, in Hebrew. Um, and uh, most certainly I can't read Hebrew. Um, but you have the great advantage that you can actually read it in the original language. And, of course, that language is a, is a fascinating language. And, and a bit of a miracle has happened in the last couple of hundred years with that language. So say a bit about that. It is astonishing. I don't think there's another example, I can't think of one, of a language which was, which was dead, which was not a living language that has actually come back to life. And it's, it's simply the case that if Moses or Joshua were to be walking down a street in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, he would be able to go into a shop and buy something. Uh, probably not a PlayStation, but he could buy something. Um, and it's, 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 truly, it's truly remarkable. And, you know, the Hebrew language is a life in itself. It has it has words that are impossible to translate. There are certain words that don't appear in Hebrew. Uh, people who have spent time in Israel won't be surprised that there's no word for, for subtle, and there's no word for like nuance. Those are not our specialties. But there, but there, but there, are, but there are other words, like um, there's a beautiful word, nachat, which is the type of joy you can only get from your children. Or there's a word, um, lefargen, which is the type of pleasure that you get from somebody else succeeding in something. It's a beautiful idea. There's, there's other words which are really impossible to translate. Um, there's a word, dafka, which means exactly the opposite has happened to what you would have expected. So, dafka, on the one day I didn't take my umbrella, it poured with rain. Or, or you know, if Humphrey Brogart had been an Israeli, 
he would have said, of all of the bars in all of the world, Dafka, you had to walk into mine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so again, it's a language, a language is a life. But one of the things that's incredible is that, is that um, without even realizing it, Israelis, secular Israelis, are, are digging down into their history. You know, if there is a draw in football, Israelis will call it a teku. And, and where does that phrase come from? It's actually a phrase 2,000 year olds from the, from the Talmud that describes an argument between two rabbis where neither side wins. And it is used by people in the soccer stands just without thinking about it. So you know, the language is really a life. Well, I, I tried learning Hebrew. I only lasted an hour and I gave up because it was so complicated. But give us, give us a Hebrew lesson. Uh, Explain to us how to first of all, with absolute teach us Hebrew and then we can read the Old Testament in Hebrew. First of all, I want to tell you that Hebrew is genuinely an easy language. It is completely phonetical. So, you know, I once heard a Hebrew teacher who one of her students complained that, um, that it was difficult to learn Hebrew, and she looked at him and he says, you think writing neighborhood is easy? <laughs> you know, we don't have any of those problems. But I want to teach you something about the Hebrew letters. Um, the first thing you need to know is that unlike English, Hebrew goes from right to left, not left to right. And that is because it's a very old language. Languages that developed like English when people were writing already, writing like on with quills, went like that because it's easier to write that way. But if you go back to the very old languages, they were chiseled in stone. And if you're chiseling, it's actually much easier to go that way from right to left. So we're going to start at this side of the page and move across. So first of all, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet most important here, of course, is Aleph, Alpha. Mm -hmm. this, is, um, this is the most spiritual letter. It's the letter that symbolizes God. And interestingly, it has no sound at all. It only has a sound if you add dots on top or ab above or below that make a vowel sound. But that's the, that's the beginning of everything. Now, the second letter is called Bet. Bet in Hebrew means a house. And you can see in a very simple caveman-like way, it sort of looks like a house. It's also the very first letter of the Bible. Uh, the word in the beginning, that's how the Bible begins, in Hebrew is bereshit. And in Kabbalistic teaching, they say it's, it starts with a bet, because in a sense, if you're coming back along the word, it's sort of closed off. You can't go back further. There's a limit to how much you can understand the mysteries of the Lord that are beyond that. So that is Bet. Then the next letter is Gimel. Gimel, it makes the G sound. Gimel in Hebrew actually means a camel. And again, in a very strange caveman sort of way, you can see something a little bit camelish about it. And then, <laughs> and then uh, the next letter is Dalad, which means a door. Um, but what's... Um, the, the, all of the letters have an amazing depth. The Talmud describes a teacher who is teaching his children. And he points out to them something else. Gimel, Gimel can mean to give, to give of yourself. And Dalet can mean a poor person, a person in need. So in the Talmud, this is 2,000 years ago, he's teaching the children. Children, can you see how this Gimel, this giving person, his leg is running forward. He is running to give of himself. But the Dalet... This person has his face turned away from him because when you want to give to people, you need to give it in a way that they're not embarrassed. They don't have to look you in the face. Ideally, you give to them in a way maybe they don't even know who it is that's giving. Now, how does the Hebrew language work? It connects these letters. And so, for example, if we connect these three letters, B, G, and D, we'll put some vowels in. Those make S sounds. So that makes the word Beged. Beged in Hebrew is an article of clothing. It's a clothing or a coat. Why? Because we've taken three consecutive letters and we've stitched them together. So we've made an article of clothing. It's also the word in the Bible that means to betray someone, to cheat them. Why? Because what you're doing is you're cloaking yourself. You're hiding your true intentions. It's a, it's a deception. So, so literally every, every letter and every word has amazing, I could carry on, but I urge you to try and think about learning Hebrew. It's not as difficult as it looks. And, uh, and Reverend Nicky will prove it to you um, by picking Absolutely. up his Hebrew book. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, 
the, the Hebrew uh, scriptures, the story starts with uh, these stories, but right at the heart of it is, is the Exodus. And that's so important, isn't it, that, that in, in the, the story, that remembering that you, you talk about remembering that we, you were in slavery. This is a key thing. Why is that so important? Uh, it is absolutely key. I think, I think one of the reasons is that, you know, there's a tendency if something difficult or em embarrassing has happened in our lives, we want to try and hide them, we want to try and forget them, we want to try and sublimate them. But what our tradition tells us is, no, we need to carry those things with us and we need to learn from them. So it's absolutely crucial for, for us to remember that we were strangers in Egypt, we were slaves in Egypt, because that is the way that we will have empathy for people who are in difficult positions elsewhere. So it's extraordinarily important when we sit around the Seder table on Passover that our children learn that we were slaves. We know what it is to be in difficult situations because that is the way that we hope that they will grow up and they will have empathy to help people who are in difficult situations. In Israel, you know, you know Israelis take a tremendous sense of pride that when there is a disaster somewhere in the world, like a, a tidal wave in, in Haiti or a, an earthquake in Turkey, uh, we try to be amongst the first people who are on the ground setting up field hospitals. And I think that comes from this sense that we remember what it is to be in difficult situations, and we really want to try and, and reach out and be a part of the solution. So we remember, but it's not remembrance for history's sake, it's remembrance as a kind of inspiration to, to look forward and try and build a better future. And part of that is the festivals that you have. Right. Just say a bit more about those festivals. Um, well, first of all, the, the, the people have, have, have summarized all of Jewish festivals in one sentence, which is, they tried to kill us, we survived, now let's eat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and definitely the food is an extraordinarily important part. And, and, and the reason is, you know, the festivals have to appeal to, to every part of, of our society. And one of the ways is to make them very tactile, to try and make, make them appeal to all our senses, to smell, to touch. So we make them in, in very lively ways. We have different kinds of festivals. Just very briefly, we start our year with the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And those are actually, they're not fun New Year festivals. They're actually very thoughtful. We think about how we behaved the last year, how we want to behave the next year, what we can do differently. Then we have three what are called pilgrim festivals. Those are the times when in ancient times people would go to the temple, they would bring, bring their offerings. And what's wonderful is people have started coming back to Israel for those festivals. The first is Passover where we remember the Exodus and today we have these massive Seder meals with a lot of drinking and singing. The second we call Shavuot, Pentecost, which is when we celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And we mark that by by many things, but mainly by staying up all night to study the Bible and, and to show how much we appreciate it. And then we have tabernacles. Tabernacles is, is when we go out and we build beautiful huts in the, in the garden and appreciate the protection of God. And then we have a couple of, of other festivals like Hanukkah, which is a small festival that hit the big time because it happens to fall at the same time as Christmas. So, you know, we were looking for something so our kids wouldn't feel that. But it's a remarkable story of Jewish survival. And the Purim story, another story of Jewish survival, the remarkable story of Queen Esther. And, and just to add, we are actually today in an amazing period of the Jewish calendar because all of the festivals I've described to you were festivals that are about 2,000 years old. But we are in a period now of a couple of weeks where we have, we have four days that were added to the Jewish calendar in our time, literally in our lives and the lives of our parents. Sad days and happy days. The first, about a week and a half ago, is what's called Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, a very sad day, as you can imagine. The second, just this last week, Israel's Remembrance Day, or a day when we remember those people who have been killed in, in acts of terrorism and so on. Then we have Israel's Independence Day, you know, the return to the land of Israel after 2,000 years. And next, year, next week we have Jerusalem Day, you know, when Jews were the, able to pray in Jerusalem for the first time after many years in 1967. But if you think about it, having new days added to your calendar is really a sign that you're re-entering history. And, uh, and so that's a very special feeling indeed. So uh, part of it is looking back, part of it is looking forward, our dreams. Uh -huh. I, I was fascinated by the chapter in your book about dream, Joseph's dreams. Right. 
First of all, dreams are very, very important in, uh, in Judaism. There's a story about a guy who phones up his psychiatrist, and he says, I had a terrible dream. I dreamt you were my mother. And the psychiatrist said, well, what did you do? He said, I went downstairs and my made, made myself some breakfast. He says, what did you have for breakfast? Some coffee and some toast. And the psychiatrist says, coffee and toast? You call that a breakfast? <laughs> So, so dr dreams are important, but I think the story of the story of um, the story of Joseph, to my mind, is remarkable. Joseph, you know, has has three sets. In the story of Joseph, there are three sets of dreams, the three pairs of dreams. The first ones are the ones that he tells to his brother. You remember when he wants to be the leader, he says, "Your sheaves bow down to mine; the stars bow down to mine." Then a little bit later, he's in prison, and the butler and the baker come to him, and they tell him their dreams. And he tells them what's going to happen. And then later, he is brought to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh tells him his dreams of the, the ears of corn and the, and, and the cows. And he interprets those and, and, and deals with the famine in Egypt. But what's amazing is Joseph's dreams only start being fulfilled after the third set of dreams, right at the very end. Why is that? And I think there's something very interesting that happens in that progression of dreams. Because when Joseph starts... His dreams are only about himself. He is at the center. He sees himself as being the only thing that's important. Then when he's speaking to the butler and baker, he at least is thinking about the people who are next to him. But then finally, when he's in front of Pharaoh, he explains the dreams as relating to the whole of society. His, his circle of empathy is getting bigger and bigger. He's beginning to care about other people. And something else is changing as well, which is the first dream... He doesn't do anything about. He just tells them. He just dreams them. The second one, with the butler and the baker, he actually actively goes out of himself to interpret them. And then finally, the final dreams, he doesn't just interpret them, but he implements them. He is put in charge of collecting the grain and looking after the people who are hungry and so on. And I think there's an important lesson here. Dreams are important, but if we want them to come true, if we want them to be fulfilled... First of all, we need to make sure that our dreams are as broad, as wide, as inclusive as possible, care about as many people as possible. And secondly, we need to remember that the dreams won't be fulfilled by themselves. As somebody once said, we are the people we've been waiting for. We actually have to work to implement them. So if we do that, then hopefully our dreams will be fulfilled. And of course, Joseph was a remarkable leader. And uh, you write also about leadership and the importance of leadership. Um, that's absolutely right, although I do think that leadership is something, you know, certainly I think in our tradition and in, and in Israel as well, we tend to think not of leaders but as everybody who is able to exercise leadership. Everybody needs to find their leadership in themselves. I remember once hearing a story about a person who went to, um, to be interviewed for a university and the interviewer said to him, tell me, would you say you were a leader or a follower? And the guy said, the student said, to tell you the truth, I think I'm a follower. And the interviewer said, thank goodness for that. I've had 200 leaders in here this morning. <laughs> so I think, you know, a part of leadership is to, know, is, to know where, is, is to know where to follow and to find that leadership in yourself. There's a very interesting uh, chapter again in, in where you talk about um, Jethro and the way in which Jethro helps with leadership. Just say a bit, say a bit about well, First that. of all, Jethro, Jethro taught Moses how to be a leader. Moses had tremendous problems in being a leader. And it was his father-in-law, Jethro, who was not Jewish, but had a lot of experience as being a religious leader in Midian. But I think there's something else we can learn. You know, there's a, a phrase which is used a lot in Hebrew today. Baruch Hashem means thank God, let us praise the Lord. It comes three times in the Bible. And interestingly, it is never said by a Jewish person. You know, throughout the Bible, it's said three times by non-Jewish people, by Noah, by Eliezer, Abraham's servant, and by Jethro. You know, the Jews, unfortunately, the children of Israel, they're complaining that the water doesn't taste right, that the manna's not good enough. But the people who actually recognize that miracles are happening, those are our non-Jewish friends. And I have to say, often it's when I sit with our Christian friends and friends of other faiths, and they visit Israel or they see what has been happening with the Jewish people, they help us open our eyes to some of the miracles that are really happening today. 
One of the um, chapters I really enjoyed was when you talk about, well, we call, I, I've always called the ironic blessing or the priestly blessing in, in the book of number, chapter 6 in Numbers, which, um, the Lord bless you and keep you. This is a prayer that uh, my wife Pippa used to say over our children practically every night, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. Um, it's an astonishing prayer. It's, it's probably the oldest prayer as a prayer that we know. Uh, I'll say it to you in Hebrew just so you get a feeling of the sound of it. I don't know what it sounds like to you, but to me it sounds beautiful, actually. It's an, it's, it's an old blessing. I recognize shalom. Uh, shalom at the end. Yeah. Shalom is a word you are. See, uh, Reverend Nikki is already speaking Hebrew. <laughs> and... Um, First of all, it's, it's a blessing that every Friday night we give each of our children, um, and it's gorgeous. But I tell you, my, one of my very, very favorite moments in, in religious life, you know, it's, it's called the priestly blessing because it's the blessing that is given by the priests to the rest of the congregation. So in, in our synagogues, we still have people who are descended from the priests of old, and they go up uh, into the front of the synagogue, they raise their hands, and here's a curiosity, they do that with their hands, which most of you probably know as the Vulcan death grip or something like that. But the reason you know that is because Leonard, Leonard Nimoy, the actor who played Spock, is Jewish, is one of the priestly family, and he borrowed this sign actually from synagogue when he was little. So, um, but they stand up, they raise their hands, and they bless the congregation with this beautiful blessing. And our, our tradition, certainly in my synagogue, is that your children gather around you, and you, you huddle together under your, your prayer shawl while you are being blessed by the congregation. And it's an extraordinarily beautiful moment. So it's very special indeed. It's amazing. And uh, you know, just to go back to this thing, of reading the Bible, you read, you, basically the readings of, of the whole year. And I know this thing of reading the Bible is, is a big thing. And you, you told me a story earlier, which I'd love you to tell oh, me about. Oh, yes. Um, there's a wonderful historian uh, who's written you know, dozens and dozens of books, but one of them is the history of the Jews. His name is Paul Johnson. He's an elderly man now. He's in his 80s. But he told me that when he was a young man, he visited Israel, and he met the first prime minister of Israel, who was called David Ben-Gurion, who was a great scholar of the Bible. And when he met him, David Ben-Gurion was sitting behind a big copy of the Old Testament, and he said to him, he said to him, young man, I have one piece of advice for you. Read the Bible. From beginning to end, don't take any breaks. Read it consecutively from beginning to end. It will change the way you see the world. And he said, I wasn't a particularly religious kid. It didn't, you know, but I had respect for this man. So I decided to do it. And he was absolutely right. It changed the way I saw the world. Then Paul Johnson, who became very eminent here in the UK, said, many years later, I was very friendly with Margaret Thatcher when she was prime minister. And I said to her, Margaret, I've got one piece of advice for you. <laughs> Read the Bible. From beginning to end, consecutively, it will change the way you see the world. And she looked at me like I was mad, says Paul Johnson. But four months later, she came up to me and she said, Paul, I did it. So there you have the first prime minister of, da of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, actually getting Margaret Thatcher to read the Bible from beginning to end. I think it was wonderful. <laughs> Amazing story. Amazing. It, Dan, it's been so great having you. Just as a, a closing question, it, um, the con congregation here and uh, down at um, Onso Square and all those watching down in the spring, any closing words to encourage them, inspire them to, to read the Bible? Well, first of all, I have to say what I've seen here is totally inspiring in itself. So I'm coming away inspired. The, the atmosphere that you have in here is, is, is quite extraordinary. I think, I think today, unfortunately, people see issues of faith very often as things that divide us. And I think one of the importances of the Bible is it's something that brings us back together. It is a text that means so much to so many of us. It means different things as we grow older. One of the wonderful things about reading the Bible year after year is you realize how much you've changed as a person. The text is the same, but it seems different to you. How can that be? It can only be because something inside you has changed. So I think using it as a, as a meeting place 
a meeting place for people of different faiths, of different generations. Obviously, I would urge you to try and get the experience to come and do some Bible study in Israel because to do that and then look up and see the hills where these events actually happened is an extraordinarily special experience. And so I look forward to, to meeting you again here, there, but certainly in the Bible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, so much. Daniel Tav. Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. Perfect.